Hey everyone, um, today we're going to be talking about one of the most core parts of the Chainlink protocol, uh, the Chainlink node, and we're going to figure out how we can run one ourselves. Again, if uh, you've missed some of my other demos, my name is Zach Ayush. I'm a developer advocate with Chainlink Labs. So before we just dive into a uh, a chain link node, we will talk about what it is and then we'll do a little demo. So what is a chain link node? A chain link node is software that sits in between the blockchain and the outside world. It is the core piece of software for running a decentralized Oracle network, or it can act as a standalone piece of software as a node on its own. It's written in the programming language Golang. Um, and again, many nodes can be combined to form a decentralized Oracle network or a DAWN. This is truly the core of how um, the Chainlink Oracle network works. So what are the core components of a Chainlink node when you're running it? Um, well, a Chainlink node can be essentially um, set into two different things. Uh, initiators and tasks, which make up jobs. This tell the node what to do. Um, so nodes can listen for specific events emitted on the blockchain. And in response to these events, they can perform the job. It is initiators that can listen for these events. Um, initiators can do more than just listen to, to events. They can also start your node jobs with any arbitrary conditions um, that you may want. So a job is a series of tasks that a node must perform in response to those events. And how do we define those tasks? Well, we have very um, strict task definitions. Um, so you might have a series of tasks that says, hey, go receive a uint um, in, a in a JSON file using a git request, parse that data, take that uint out, multiply it by some constant, um, convert it to an Ethereum readable format and post that number to the blockchain. Again, each of these atomic units of work is called a task. You can kind of see example of that on the right there with a task list. So I mentioned that there's all kinds of different types of initiators that can start off our job runs. So what are some examples of the different types of initiators? First, we have cron, which runs the job on a set schedule, maybe every day, every hour. One of the most common, a direct request initiator. So again, this is when a smart contract actually emits an event. The node will listen for that event and start a job in response. You have flex monitor jobs, which is for DONs. Um, these will look for a certain deviation in, in price data and start a new round in a, in a decentralized Oracle network. You have uh, the keeper job type, which will virtually run a method until it returns true and then run a specific function on the blockchain. Off-chain reporting, which is like Flux Monitor, but is part of an off-chain aggregation protocol in the DON. And finally, a webhook, which can be initiated by HTTP requests. Um, and these HTTP requests could come from a user yourself or most likely a external initiator, which is a bot. So to dive in a little bit into specifically into external initiators, uh, again, these are used in conjunction with specifically uh, the webhook initiator to essentially allow your jobs to activate under any arbitrary conditions you wish. So um, within that external initiator, we can go in, we can program it, we can customize it, and we can say, send a HTTP request to our Chainlink node um, under any arbitrary conditions that we can program. Uh, for example, I could have a arbitrary uh, external initiator that scans a pizza store's API for pizza deliveries. It wants a specific pizza is delivered. It communicates with uh, the node um, 
to start a job and post some data onto the blockchain. Um, initiators talk to uh, nodes via a thing called a bridge. Next, uh, to dive a little bit into tasks. Again, tasks are how we define how our node is going to do work and what work that node is going to do. Um, task can be ta task can be chained together within a within the node to form what's called a full job or a pipeline. Pipelines are a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, and expressed in dot syntax. You can see an example of uh, some task syntax up there on the top. Each task has a specific uh, uh, has a, spe a specific user specified ID uh, or UID, um, and a set of a specific set of configuration parameters and attributes. Um, there are many built-in task types such as HTTP, uh, mean, and uh, JSON parse. But you may want to make your own task that's not inbuilt with the Chainlink Node software. And that's where external adapters um, or I like just customizable tasks come in. So just like external initiators, let us customize how we wanted to initiate our node job runs any way we wanted. External adapters let us customize any kind of task that we want. External adapters are also required for any jobs that would require um, authorization at the API level. Like you, you need some API keys that you want to store within your node. And the cool thing is because these are se run separate from the actual node software, they can be programmed in any language you want. There are pre-built templates available on, on GitHub in JavaScript and Python. Again, Nodes communicate with external adapters through bridges, just like they do um, with uh, external initiators. And um, these external adapters send post requests, uh, post HTTP requests to the EA to get them started. External adapters really enable node operators and nodes to do anything you can conceivably think of. So we'll jump into a demo. I don't think we'll have time to get into uh, best practices today. I know that uh, we had that in the first slide, but uh, that could be a topic all on its own. And there's some great documentation on our docs website for that. Okay, so um, this is what I have set up for running a node. We'll actually walk through um, a lot of this, but we're gonna get Docker um, and have it running. Um, a free Inferior Alchemy account, a Postgres database, uh, a MetaMask wallet in the browser, some testnet ETH, and testnet link. We're not going to be actually running any external adapters or external initiators today. We're just going to create a basic job pipeline. And we're going to know that runs a job in the docs, um, that uh, runs the same job in the docs in any API. Um, section to get uh, the ETH USD 24 hour volume from Crypto Can Bear. And so where I'm gonna start is in the Chainlink docs. For a lot of my demos, we go straight here because the Chainlink docs have a lot of great step-by-step um, -step guides on how to do anything you wanna do in the, in the Chainlink network. So let's go ahead and click on the docs. And it already takes us to the node operators section up here. Um, this is where we'll want to be. And on our left nav bar, we're going to see node operators, um, an overview explaining um, how the node operate, how the node software is the core component of the Chainlink network. And we'll click on running a Chainlink node because that's what we want to do. So it's going to go ahead and give you the requirements. Um, we can run this software from source. So if we click on these instructions here. It'll take us to the GitHub repo for the Chainlink software and tell you how to run it from source. This is definitely a viable way to do it, but we're gonna use Docker. 
The reason we're going to use Docker is because it already sets up a lot of our environment for us and is uh, constantly updated with the um, newest versions um, that you can just pull from. So we're going to follow the using Docker steps as recommended. And if you don't have Docker installed, you can run one of these commands to, uh, depending on what your OS is. Or you can go to the Docker website, docker.com, and um, search until you find where the downloads are. We'll go ahead and say get started. And we're gonna down, you're going to want to download Docker Desktop. It's already selected for my computer. You can find one that fits uh, the computer that you're running your node software on. And this could be on the cloud as well. If that's where you so if that's where you choose to run it. Okay, so one of the first steps it's going to have us do is create a directory. So let's open our terminal. And like most things in this hackathon, the Covan testnet is a great testnet to run on. So we'll go ahead and switch to here and we're going to copy this command. Go into our terminal and we'll paste it. I've already created this directory within my computer, so I'm not actually going to hit enter. Um, but if you just hit enter, it'll run. Um, nothing will show, but it'll have created the directory. And we can check here. We'll see where we're at. If we do, I'm in my um, home directory. And if I do ls-a and we look here, we can see dot chainlink dash covan. That's the directory you just uh, created. All right, so we'll clear out the terminal, scroll down. And the next step we're going to do is create an environment file. Um, so this is what our Docker image is going to read and it's gonna tell it how we want our node configured. Um, we see there's a bunch of um, different settings already set for us here in this example.env file. It sets the ETH chain ID to 42, which points it to Covan. If we have it on this Covan tab, it tells us where the link token is located, um, some, so, some ports we want, um, you know, if we want secure cookies. Uh, you know, this is set to false. This is for demo purposes and just kind of uh, practicing running a node. Um, some of these you'll want to customize based on a, a production environment. And you can learn more about that in the best practices setting. Uh, but for now, we'll copy this command here. And again, you just go back to your terminal and you can just paste all of that and that'll do all the work automatically uh, for you. And hit enter and it'll go ahead and create a .env file. It's gonna create it within that .chainlink slash coven directory and it's gonna fill in that .env file with everything that we say here, see here. Okay, so again, I've already run this. So, you know, hit enter, do it. Next, this is where we're gonna go ahead and put in our .env file a URL for our Ethereum client. And, um, we can do it from an Ethereum client on the same machine. So we can run our own node and connect to that node, or we can use an external provider. We're gonna go the external provider route today um, because that's much easier um, than running a chain link node. Um, you can make that decision for yourself if you needed to go to production, but um, you know, running a chain link node can be heavy on um, the computer's resources. So for this demo, we're gonna be using a, um, an external provider. Um, so let's go ahead and get that, that URL. Let's go to Alchemy. I'm just gonna type in Alchemy blockchain on here. And one of the first things that's gonna come up is alchemy.com. 
So we'll click on that. You can create an account for free. Click login. It remembers me from um, my cookies. And you see I already have a couple of projects set up. Um, one called Node Operator Demo. This is the one I'm going to be using. But if you want to make your own, you can click Create App. Um, you know, name it whatever you want. Give it whatever description. And make sure you, we're going to just put it on staging and connect, say we want the Ethereum chain and the Covan network. Uh, you can create app and boom, you have it here. We're actually going to look at the node operator demo one, go to view details, view key. And this is where you can get your um, provider URL. So we're going to actually use the WebSockets URL here. So we can just go ahead and copy that. Um, or keep it up. We're going to keep it up for later. Um, so you actually, you don't want to share this with others. Uh, so they don't access your, um, your Alchemy project URL and spam it. Uh, but I'm showing it to you, uh, everyone for this purpose of this demo. Okay. So if we go back, um, we're going to do Ethereum client as an external provider. And we're just gonna write one line to our .env file located there. Um, and so we'll copy this command, go back to our terminal. Paste it in. And we'll scroll and we don't wanna put eth URL equals change me. We'll delete the change me part. Go back to our alchemy, make sure our WebSockets URL is copied in. Come here and we'll paste it in right there. Zoom in a little bit there. So make this a little bit more clear. All right, um, hit enter and this will write this line to our .env file and chainlink dash covan. It is, um, once again, I've already got my EMV set up, so I won't actually hit enter. We'll, we'll clear that out. And back to the dive. So see what our next steps are. Finally, we're going to need to tell the node software a database URL for the database we want to connect to. The database is going to store all of the permanent information we're going to want for our node operator. Uh, for our node software, like our job run history and the jobs that we've actually created. So this is a pretty important step. Um, as you can see, again, this URL is just a um, another file, another line that we put in our .env file. But let's look at, there's a bunch of different variables we need to fill in here. Let's look at what they are. We have our username, the username for our database, the password, the uh, password for that database, our uh, IP address of our server, our, our port, and um, the type of database we're running. So you can actually run this as, uh, you can create a database on a, on a um, cloud provider. And if you want to do that, you can click on connecting to a remote database and it'll walk you through some steps that you need to complete. We're actually gonna run this database locally, so it's on our computer, the same computer we're running our node on. And the steps are essentially the same. We're still going to write this um, database, this database um, line in our .env file um, to our, we're gonna write this line to our .env file and we're just going to replace our uh, server section with a, with a local host, the local host our um, database is located at. So for the purpose of this demo, what the database I'm gonna run is Postgres. And we can type in Postgres. And in this case specifically, I'm gonna go to postgresapp.com. So this is a, a really easy way on Mac to get Postgres running, it gives you a very convenient GUI and also installs all of the Postgres 
installations that we'll need. If you're not on Mac, you can just download a typical Postgres uh, download installation uh, from Postgres SQL. It gives you a bunch of different instructions on um, how to download it, some great documentations. You know, you can click download and pick the operating system of your choice um, and follow along with the steps. So I'm gonna go through with the Postgres app. Um, it's as simple as just downloading. You can click uh, you know, installing Postgres app, um, moving it to the application folder. And once you get it uh, installed and running, I already have it installed. You can click on Postgres, get it going. And you can actually initialize a new database. So if I stop this, um, when you first uh, run your database, you'll see an initialize step here. You can click on that to, to get a, a new database running and customize some of the settings you have. It'll walk you through um, on the download, but these are the default settings that our database is set to. And you'll notice that a lot of these are the same um, name as those variables we saw in our .env file line. So, you know, we have our host, it's gonna be local host. It's gonna to default to running off port 5432. Our user is gonna be the same as my system's username. The database is the same as the user. It's not gonna have a password by default and um, it'll just give you the full connection URL here. So we can copy this command, go to our terminal, we'll paste it in. And you know we'll make sure in our Postgres app, we have our databases running. This is the databases that it creates when you just initialize a new one. This is what it defaulted to, one called Postgres, an empty template, and a one based off of the username of my account. So everything's running, we're good. If you look at server settings, it's running off of port 5432, uh, that default we're talking about. You can see where some of our config files are located. Okay, so now let's actually fill in some of these variables with the variables that are local to me. We will go to So, we will go ahead and change our username. All right, we're going to connect to the Zach database, so the username is going to be um, Zach. Look here real quick. Double check to make sure it's all right. Yep. And so we do not have a password. So we'll just go ahead and get rid of the password field altogether. Now for our server import, um, this is where if you had an AWS database, you'd put in the URL um, for that AWS database and the port. But we're running this uh, database locally on our machine. But here's the thing, we're running the database locally on our machine, but we're running the node on Docker. Um, so what this um, Docker virtualizes um, creates a virtualized environment for our node software to run on. So it's kind of like it's on its own little computer within our computer. And it, it isn't natively ready to communicate um, with a local host running on the main machine. So we can't just put in local host uh, 5432 right here. We actually need to put in here out at server here. So we actually need to put in, uh, we want the at sign. We want host.docker.internal. Internal. And for our port, we'll say 5432.
This will tell Docker to communicate with the local host on our actual machine and connect to that database we have running. Finally, for the database name, this is where you put the name of the database you're connecting to. And we're actually not going to connect to the Postgres database. We're going to connect to the database, database called Zach here. So you know, this is where you could put Postgres or whatever it's called. I'm going to put Zach. That's the database we want to connect to. Again, this will write a line to our .env file with all this information. But we're not quite done right now. So if we scroll back over here, we're going to see this important little call out in the docs. If you're testing, you can add this line to the end of our URL, question mark, SSL mode equals disable. Um, this will get rid of any SSL um, uh, encryption going in between our requests and between our Docker and our uh, database. This is what we want. Of course, it says, however, we should never do this in production. Of course, you're going to want encryption. You want to make sure you have all your security in place in a production environment. But again, for this demo, um, we're going to go ahead and disable that to make our lives easier. We don't have to deal with certificates and all that fun stuff. So at the end, we'll put in question mark, SSL mode, SSL mode equals disabled. We're gonna hit enter. It'll it'll do its magic, and um, you know, it'll it'll just go to the next line and go ahead and write this line onto our um, EMV file. Mine is already set up with this exact line, so go ahead and clear it. So once we got that, the doc said we can just uh, start our chain link node. Um, and it gives you a convenient command we can run to just get it going and running. And it'll actually pull um, the Docker image we need uh, by running this command. If we scroll over, we can look at the command. It um, just changes into our directory, tells Docker to run on a specific port, and tells it what um, our .env file is and where it's located and what version we're going to want. Now, that's important. So again, we'll copy this. Go back to our terminal. We'll paste it in. Now, we're not going to run it as is. Let's see what happens if we do. We're going to say, it's, hey, there's no version um, that's been made. So we'll hit up. And we'll clear out our placeholder for version. And we're going to want to run the latest um, release of our Chainlink node software. So how can you figure out what that is? Well, we can either go to the Chainlink GitHub. So if I type in Chainlink GitHub. It will be our first link. And we can see what the latest releases are on the right. We're at smart contract kit slash chain link. See what our releases are here. So version 1.0.0 is the latest version. So that's actually pretty exciting. We can run um, 1.0.0 in this demo. Um, you know, it'll give you some things that have changed and the co uh, course, um, the um, source code right here that are that is zipped. But we're running this from Docker, so another place we can go is we can type in Chainlink Docker. This will take us to the Docker hub for Chainlink. We can go to Tags, and this will show us some of the latest versions we can pull from from Docker. And if you wanted to just pull it separate from uh, running that command in the Chainlink docs, it'll give you the Docker pull command you can put in your terminal. But again, it's showing the latest as 1.0.0, which is what we're going to run. So we'll come here and we'll go back to our terminal and we'll replace that version of placeholder with 1.0.0.
and hit enter. So the first time you run this, it's going to ask you for a password for your key store. Um, you're just gonna make whatever password you want, uh, make it something strong. The key store is what that stores uh, all of your keys, uh, including your wallet keys, where you'll have all of your currency stored. It'll create, uh, uh, it'll store your keys for various um, off-chain messaging like OCR, um, where the, the nodes can communicate with each other in an encrypted fashion. Um, all of this is explained here. The next uh, uh, password you're going to enter or username and password for the API or the GUI. So you'll see here in a second when we log in, um, when we get the chain link node running, there's going to be a convenient GUI we can go to and put our username and password and get into the uh, chain link node via the GUI. So make all of these strong, um, maybe store them in a uh, password manager. I've already created mine, so I'm just going to go ahead and get my password out. I actually store passwords in form. So I'm gonna paste my password in. I'm not gonna share it, of course, it will hit enter. And now we can see our node is running. Great. Um, but we just have it running in this uh, terminal here. We're actually going to want to interact with that node, uh, create a job. So we're going to want to um, actually log into that GUI. So we'll move this terminal out of the way. And we'll see here that it's actually running on a local host. Um, so we'll go ahead and click on our local host here and we should get our GUI showing. Awesome. Let's close out some of these tabs now. So um, again, I'm using a password manager here, one password to manage my passwords, make sure this is a strong password and just using kind of one of my old um, deprecated emails. We'll access account and this will pop up our chain link operator software we've got it running it's connected to our database our uh, GUI is showing um, and let's just kind of give it a, a short tour here uh, we have our chain link operator um, logo here which will take us back to our home page we can look at any jobs that we have set up I already have one a single one set up we'll set up a new one for this demo any runs, um, chains that we have config to connect to, in this case, chain ID 42. We have it set to connect to Covan, which we set in our .env file. Bridges, um, we're not using any bridges. We're not gonna talk to external adapters or external initiators. Um, some transactions that have been made our key stores, these are very important. Of course, this is something you would never want to share in, um, in real life if you're running an actual node for production. Uh, but for this demo, this is just kind of a test node. And we can actually look at uh, those configuration variables we set up in our .env file in this convenient, uh, easy to read format right here. Uh, we got our ETH URL that we set to Alchemy, uh, external initiators, all kinds of fun stuff. And actually, if you want to see that um, .env file um, where it's at, we can quickly go there. We'll open a new terminal. I'm already in my root directory. We'll go and list out all the files. We're going to want to change into this chainlink.covan directory that we made earlier in the demo. We we'll want to type in CD, post that directory in. Here we can see all the files that we have within that directory that were made. We've got a couple of things, some logs, uh, some cookies. Um, but we're just going to open our .env file. We'll type in vim env, and those are this is that env file. 
um, viewed from right within our terminal. Uh, you can see all the lines that we set. Everything is as we set it. Awesome. I have one extra line here. Feature external initiators true. Um, if you decide you want to use uh, external initiators, you're going to need to uh, activate this line in your .env to get them to show up in your um, node operator software. All right, so let's go ahead and exit out of them. We'll say colon Q. Right, so we're out of there. All right, so back to our node operator software. So we've kind of given it a tour. We can log out here, we're running version one. Let's go ahead and get a job. Uh, we're going to create a new job, and we're actually going to try to connect to our node. Um, so we go back to the docs. The next section in the docs after running a chain node is fulfilling requests. And so we'll go ahead and go there. That's what we want to do. Um, it's going to talk about, it's going to go through, say, hey, we're going to need some testnet link, and you're going to want a MetaMask set up to store that testnet link. Um, if you don't know how to do that, go to the beginner walkthrough. We have also some uh, earlier in the hackathon, there was a, uh, a beginner uh, introduction to blockchain and Solidity demo that I ran. Um, you can go there, and I walk through getting MetaMask set up and going to the faucets. I already have uh, my MetaMask here connected to Coven. And I already have it loaded with some ETH and link. Um, configuring an Ethereum client, we are already connecting to the remote Ethereum client um, and connected to the database. We're all good there. And then it's going to give us some explanations on uh, the different type of addresses we have when running a node. This is really important to understand. So we have the node address. This is the address that was generated in our Chainlink node that, um, you know, our Chainlink node has its own wallet associated with it. Um, if we come here, go to keys. If we go to keys here, this is that account address right here. This is our, our node address. It has some ETH on it. I've already sent some ETH to this node. Um, We'll, we'll send some anyway, but uh, yeah, this is, this is, um, so this is the address for our specific node and the wallet that it stores within. But we also have the Oracle contract address. Now this is what represents our node on chain. So we have this node software running on our computer, uh, but it, uh, that alone, the blockchain doesn't know about it. So we're going to actually create a smart contract and deploy it. And this smart contract is essentially going to represent our node on chain. That's the Oracle contract, our, our operator contract. Um, and so that, that's actually, and that's actually the, the um, smart contract that our node is going to interact with and post data to. And we also have an admin wallet address um, that, uh, you know, for OCR that stores and receives our uh, link tokens. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and deploy that Oracle. Our operator is the new term for these uh, contracts. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead and deploy one to uh, the Covan network. So it gives you a... Um, we're going to have to tell it where our link token is on that specific network. It's going to give you that, that address. We're going to copy it. And we're actually going to run through and we're going to deploy this contract on Remix. So if we look right here, deploy your own Oracle contract. It says go to Remix and open the Oracle.Soul smart contract. If we click on this hyperlink, it will open Remix in our web browser. And automatically take us to the code we want. Now we actually don't actually have anything showing here because it's just a straight up import of oracle.soul 
from our um, from our chain link uh, package packages. And that's all we're going to need to deploy. It's compiling successfully. We'll make sure to go, we'll go to our deploy and run transactions page. We'll click injected web three. My MetaMask is connected to Covan, of course. And that's what's popping up. We'll make sure that our, it's pointed to the right contract here. Uh, we do want Oracle. And we're going to post our address of our link token that's required in the constructor right here. Again, I copied it from our docs and I made sure it's pointing on Covan. So we should be good. Let's click deploy and confirm. All right, so we get the green check mark. We're all good here. If we go to our left, we see that we have all these methods that was in our import statement. If you want to look more into this code and see what's actually going on under the hood, um, this is all open source. So we can actually go back to um, our GitHub. We can go to contracts, source, and we were actually using a V6, so Vero version 0 0.6. And in version 0 0.6, this is called oracle.soul. So we'll click on that. And we can see all that code here that we are importing in. And you see a lot of those same methods, the constructor that requires the link address. All right, so this is the code if you I uh, would like to look, look through it and kind of understand what's going on uh, under the hood. So I'm going to compile, deploy. We've done all of that. Yeah, we got our valid transaction, deployed contracts. So now uh, we have this, we have this uh, smart contract uh, on the Covan network. We need to tell that smart contract, hey, this is the address of our chaining node that we generated. That way the two are connected and only our node will run that smart contract. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our node software running on localhost and we're gonna copy our address of our uh, account here. So here it says in Remix, we're going to call the set fulfillment permission function uh, with that, that address of the node. And we're going to put one other parameter in there and set it as true. And this will uh, tell our smart contract, hey, this is the node that is going to be communicating with the smart contract. Let's limit it to that node. So we have set fulfillment here. Click the arrow. We can just easily... We'll paste in our node address right here and we'll set this to true. Hit transact, we're gonna write this to the blockchain. Hit confirm. We can see down here that our, it looks like our transaction went through, through and it wrote what we want and our MetaMask says the transaction went through. You can click is owner here to make sure uh, it came up as true. So since we read that from our um, our wallet, our, our you know, we, we, we set this value to true. And um, we can click on owner and we can see it's set to the wallet address that we have uh, for our node. So great. Now our final step is we're going to actually define a node in our um, in our nodes uh, a job in our node software. So we're going to copy all of this. So jobs are um, a DAG and they're written in the Toml format. Um, if we go and scroll, if you want to little learn a little bit more about jobs. We have uh, Oracle jobs here. In, in the past, Oracle jobs were written in JSON, but with 
0.0. That has been deprecated, and jobs are written in TOML now. And so if you if you previously run a node, you have, we have a convenient migration doc that will kind of tell you, hey, this is how you translate um, some job types from JSON into TOML. This is the old JSON type node uh, job pipelines. This is the new equivalent version of that in um, TOML. And we can learn a little bit more about specific tasks and um, initiators here. It's just going to call in, in TOML in 1.0.0. It's going to call initiator just jobs. So at the top, you're going to see a type, and it's going to be job. We'll go back to fulfilling requests. We we're going to add this job to our node. We'll kind of walk through some of what it's saying. We'll copy it, and we'll go back to our node account. We're going to go to jobs, and we're going to click new job. It already has an old one. I have in here the last one I made, but we'll go and clear it. And we're going to paste in the one that we just copied. Okay, so this is a job of type direct request. So it's going to, again, listen for events that occur in our uh, oracle.sol file that we created. And it's going to start a job when it uh, reads an event. We're going to call this job get uint256 because it's exactly what we're going to be doing. And one of our fields right here is um, contract address, your Oracle contract address here. We're actually going to post that smart contracts address and we're gonna, we're gonna paste it right in here. Let's go ahead and delete this. And we'll go on to remix and we'll scroll up. And this is our deployed contract. We're gonna copy this address right here. And we'll paste it in. So then it actually goes through and begins um, defining the work, the task pipeline that uh, this this node is going to do. You know, so it's going to listen for the log. It's going to decode our log. It's going to run the decode decode Cbor task. It's going to get all that data. It's going to fetch from a specific URL, parse uh, any JSON that comes back from that URL from a user-defined path, get our uint out of that JSON and multiply it by a, um, a specific value. We'll then encode that data so it's in the format that's readable by Ethereum nodes and we will actually make that transaction. We'll, 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 we'll encode the data, we'll encode the transaction, and here under submit transaction, that's where we'll actually submit our transaction. And you can see the full chain written down here. Now, you know, uh, after each of these, there's some um, um, customizable variables that we can put in. We're gonna keep them at the default. Again, if you want to learn what each of these does, so for instance, maybe we want to learn multiply. We want to go through there and see how we can change up that task. You can go to the docs. We can look for the multiply task right here, and it'll give you some parameters that we can customize. So we have input the value to be multiplied and how much to multiply it by. In this case, it's going to get that data that we parsed and it's going to multiply it by 100. Down here, we have one more place where we need to paste in our Oracle address in the submit transaction field. That should be everything we need to customize here. We're going to click create job. see if it created it. Yep, so right here, it successfully created job seven. Click on it. And uh, now we're within our job. Again, if you lose your place here, you can always click jobs up here. I clicked it twice, so I actually created two of them. Um, runs, um, 
if your job is run, we'll, we'll see that in a second. But we'll go into job with ID number seven here called get you in 256. Um, if we want to delete this job, we can. We can duplicate it and create another job just like it. Or we can just copy the job spec. And we have that definition that we made right here. All right. Proper contract address. I want to double check to make sure that is correct. Everything's good there. Let's go back to fulfilling a request. We're almost there. We're getting there. So we're at a, add a job to the node. So one other thing we're going to need here is we're going to need the uh, external job ID. This is going to tell requesters who are going to request data from our node which job that they exactly want to request from. As you see, we have multiple jobs here. And each one should have its own job ID. Our external job ID is listed down here. We're going to need this a little bit later. So we'll come back to this. Finally, we're going to need to actually send a, we're going to deploy a contract that sends a request to this node and see if it runs and gets the data that we need. Um, so conveniently here, we already have um, another contract that we can open up and remix. This is going to be the consumer contract. Again, the contract that sends the request. If we scroll through it, um, we have our, this is actually going to request the Ethereum price. And it's going to build our request, send it out, send out a get request, tell our node the path, say, yeah, we actually do want to multiply this by 100. So this is going to match the job spec that we made. And it's going to send it out. Now we have a, function here, fulfill Ethereum price, which our node will actually run and it's gonna send in our request ID and price and actually store our price in the state variable here, current price. Now remember, the node isn't actually gonna run directly at this contract. What's actually gonna happen is we're going to click, you know, request Ethereum price, that'll run, it'll make a request and it's gonna send it to the Oracle contract address that we have that represents our Oracle on chain. And that contract is going to emit an event, you know, request received. And our node is gonna hear that event. It's going to say, okay, it's gonna decode it, do all that good stuff. And then it's gonna post back to that, uh, that, that um, contract So you see we have an event Oracle request here. And we actually have a function fulfill Oracle request. This is what we're actually going to, our node is going to call and that will communicate back to the original smart contract to, um, to fulfill our request and, uh, and store our data. All right, let's go ahead and deploy this. Again, no compiler errors, injected Web3, pointed to Covan. We're going to want the right contract. This takes a testnet consumer. Deploy. Okay, so we have all of our methods here. Our current price is set to zero, which is initialized. We haven't made a request yet. And here we have request Ethereum change. We're actually gonna wanna look request Ethereum last market. We have a couple of methods we can call. I'm gonna call the request Ethereum price uh, function.
one of the things that you know you can customize in your node and per job is how much you how, how much you're going to set your fee in link tokens. In our case, our job our node is set to take 0.1 link tokens. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll we're going to send we're going to copy the address of this contract and our contract actually is going to need to link tokens, right? If we're going to make the request, we always need to load our contract itself, the link tokens. So we'll go ahead and go here, click send, paste in our contract address, put link, and I'm actually gonna send one whole link in. So we actually have the Oracle payment, you know, being set right here, multiplied by this link divisibility variable. So we can customize how how many how much uh, link uh, we actually want here, and yeah. So now all we have to do, we need to go back to our Node software. We're gonna want to check one more thing, and. If you haven't already, you're going to want to send some ETH to our account. It's not wanting to load our keys, but here you'll see that uh, Ethereum address that, rep that, that represents our node wallet and an ETH balance. I've already sent ETH to this, um, to this, soft, to this uh, wallet, so we're all good there. The node will be able to write to the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, so we're basically ready to go. We're just gonna to need to put our Oracle address and our job ID here. Our Oracle address, yeah, for our uh, Oracle contract that we deployed. We can get that here. This is where we deployed it. Put it in and finally get our job ID, which again is in our job run. Go to definition. We can copy this. We're actually not going to fill it in with um, with the dashes. So I'm going to quickly clear out all of the dashes that are found in that job ID in my text editor to make this quick. And we'll copy that in and paste it. So no dashes in there. Transact, confirm, this will send our link token, it'll send it to this Oracle address and say, hey, this is the job ID we want. And our node should find that job here in a minute and uh, run our request. Go to run, so see if anything, it hasn't picked up anything quite yet. Oh, looks like our node is going offline. So real quick to see if it's run. Uh, we have our node software here. We'll click Control C. That'll uh, exit our node. And we're just gonna start it up one more time. Rerun that command um, into your password. Get it running again. Go to our local host. And you'll see right here that we, it did pick up that job. If we go to runs, um, we can click on it. It completed successfully, so everything worked out well. Um, you can see some of the output logs here. Awesome, if we go back to a remix for our consumer contract, we click current price, boom, we have the current price of ETH in our contract. And that's that's running a chain link node. Um, again, there's uh, a lot more information. There's a lot more to it if you're gonna run this in production, you really need to have your node operating uh, and, and DevOps skills on top to be a top tier node operator. You can find some of the best practices in our documentation. Um, 
such as enabling HTTPS connections and more. And I'm actually going to suggest uh, going to the Discord chat. There's a node operators channel. Uh, we have a couple of node operators that go there and they discuss some errors they receive, some of the best practices that they run. Um, you may find Link River, uh, one of a top a top tier node operator in there, uh, answering questions. They're super helpful. And so I, I highly suggest if you want to run your node or you're interested in doing so for the hackathon, that you get involved with that channel. Um, so that was running a Chainlink node. Uh, thanks for listening in. I hope that was helpful. Um, Patrick, if you want to post the feedback form uh, for the type form in the chat um, so our viewers can uh, give some feedback, please uh, let me know how I can improve on these talks. And I hope that was uh, helpful. Thank you. Thanks again uh, for watching. See you around in the hackathon.